Welcome to the Audiation in the Wild podcast with your hosts, Bo Talifer and Eric Rasmussen. Season 2, Episode 33, Guest Star, Ron Malanga. Hi, Ron. Good morning, gents. Are we doing W? Ron Malanga here. B-E-A-U. We need a little background music. <clears throat> Welcome to W-B-E-A-U. Bo Jackson Teller for all the hits that help to spring a podcast into motion. Yeah. W-B-A-U. Yeah, I definitely have a face made for radio, so... <laughs> So, yeah. Ron, um, yes. you were telling us earlier that you started a, a new position, and it has some interesting you know, professional challenges that might come along with us. That might come am, along with the position. That yeah, we, I am. I am privileged. About. I am privileged to now be the band director and IB music teacher at Lincoln College Preparatory Academy in Kansas City, Missouri, formerly known as Lincoln High School. Most famous graduate Charlie Parker. So I. Uh, being that I, I, if there's one way I know how to use Ed Gordon's tests, it's to find that one in 500 kid who doesn't know she's the one whose musical experiences haven't led her to realize that she's a genius. And so I, I tend to come out of schools always having a, at least one or two extremely prominent graduates that to me are really credited to Ed Gordon's, the efficacy of his map tests. And uh, so no Charlie Parker has come from Lincoln High in the last, uh, what it would be, almost 60 years now. And uh, so that's that's one of my uh, pie-in-the-sky goals for the school is to... Oh, for yeah, sure. Musical aptitude profile. The to let, let the map test do their, do their thing at the upper end. Uh, yeah. But there's, there's so many other goals. Uh, to begin to try to figure out how... JRI and MLT and uh, all of the materials that are out there that, that are gauged towards middle school and high school and, and early college, uh, whether it's uh, DMTI, developing musicianship through, through, audio, through uh, improvisation, uh, Christopher Zara's books, <clears throat> and those kinds of things. I want to build a, a middle school, high school program that can be emulated worldwide and that puts audiation at the center so i'm gonna get mm -hmm. old trying if i have to but it's gonna work somehow I, you know rub my hands together with the excitement of the thought of it and the kids yeah. are absolutely lovely yeah oh i bet yeah and again yeah. you know i already respect the challenge you're engaged in because i've uh i've been up to this in one-on-one -on -one lessons just trying to make trying to fuse mlt in with the you know the classical uh, exam circuit the classical mm. guitar exams classical piano exams how do you take existing curriculum and yep. inject mlt into it in a way that's uh you know enhancing both hopefully but at least putting mlt to to work in these contexts where um, where it can flourish and, and so I've, i haven't done this in the band uh in the high school or, or just school band context, but I, I can already, my head's already spinning with the amount of issues that could come up. <laughs> there, there, there are, yeah, you go ahead and list them so I don't have to. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we, you know, it's funny, um, even, even just the uh, walking into a high school that doesn't currently have a marching band um, and used to, and there's various reasons why it kind of uh, began uh, to stop. Uh, I, I don't know the exact date, but I, I stopped seeing, um, marching band kind of awards and things like that and in, in some trophies in 2016 but i think it lasted at least maybe it bumped into COVID and, and then went away but you know i want to get a i want to get a pep band going i want to get uh almost a, a hbcu style marching band that can really just stomp the yard and then and then a concert <laughs> band within the, the, the larger context of of you know a grow growing and enormous program just full of humans making music at all different tiers. Um, breadth is, is exciting to me across the thing. I don't like, I don't like tiny little programs and, uh, and, and growing it through MLT, through audiation, through 
authentic performance that I haven't had to train in too much. We're not pounding in three songs per concert and calling it a year. <clears throat> that kind right. of stuff is... Which uh, is, that's the same thing that happens with the, the classical exam circuit. It's yeah. Three songs yeah. a year that people can't even play at the end of the year with the audition, but that, you know, they're struggling with all year anyway. Yep. Yeah, no, no I, want, I want something completely different. Um, so all these resources that I've collected over the years... Um, Bruce Stalby's um, uh, now out of out of uh, print, so to speak. I don't know what the term would be. Out of tech, um, his old um, his old uh, what, what was his melody? Audition assistant. Audition assistant. The other one, the the, the one that was melodic. Um, mm. That it was just a it was just a folk song compilation that you could you could sort by uh, by harmonic uh, function. <clears throat> and uh, that's awesome. What was that one called? Uh, I have it. I have a computer from 1999 that I keep, even though if I move <laughs> it too carefully, it, it's cracked all over the place. And I keep it strictly because I can play around with with that that program. Um, so trying to use what I can pull off of that in terms of creating a, a, a folk song sequence that's that can be sort of tumbled tumbled into. Uh, you tumble it ver based on its rhythmic content, and you reorganize it based on its harmonic functions, and you reorganize it based on its range, and you you know what I mean—a kind of yep. tumbling database like that, that that kids can come at from sort of at least four dimensions. Uh, oh, I want to do this soon only. I want to deal with something that's only six notes. Okay, mm -hmm. only six notes, but uh, but it's got uh, division elongations in it, you know, kind of thing. Um, I want to do that's that. Cool. Uh, yeah, I want to. Yeah, I want. I want it to be student friendly in the sense that uh, I've created something called a tone tracker and a rhythm record and a melody minder. They just look like Excel documents, but I took Gordon's skill sequence and basically color coded it, um, <clears throat> described it in more traditional language. And so the kids can across the top of this, this Excel document, they can follow bridging motion by just color scheme. Okay, you're going to go from imitation to creativity to improvisation. Those are the reds across the top. You want to go imitation into solfege and then jump from the solfege to solfege generalization. Those are the blues. So the kids know where the spiraling or, or bridging movement is. They know, you know, it moves stepwise across. Down the left-hand side is uh, is content uh, organized, you know, also sequentially, but so major is my, happens to be, I, I chose yellow, and so tonic and dominant, you'll see a bunch of pattern choices in tonic and dominant and yellow, then there's minor and blue, but you can skip down the page, and the kids know they can go yellow to yellow to yellow, and now they're going from tonic and dominant to adding the subdominant to adding sort of secondary functions. <clears throat> so, mm -hmm. a giant pattern tool for tone, a very similar one for rhythm, and then a, a melody one that, that takes takes all the old uh, JRI skills. You know, can you can you improvise with it, or excuse me, can you find its resting tone? You know, find its macrobeats and microbeats. Do you know its mode? Can you, you know, all this stuff into into improvisation and and uh, and composition. You know, can you can you create harmony with uh, with Twinkle? You know, sort of mm -hmm. more advanced advanced skills for young musicians. Things that also. I don't know if you know anything about the International Baccalaureate program, but every single school I've gone to, it's been identical when I've arrived. Six kids and six seniors doing it, another five to seven juniors doing it. In a school of a thousand kids, it tends to be a suffocatingly small program, and I'm sure that's because kids in 10th grade choose to opt out because they look and they think, oh, I don't have the readiness for improvisation. I don't have the readiness for composition. I don't have the readiness for the oral analysis side. Mm -hmm. That you know, traditionally we get them ready to maybe play play some tunes, but that's it. So a huge job, and I got to backwards engineer the whole thing and try to make it viable. And of course, live within the transitional period of time where hmm. someone can look through the lens of traditional state and national standards, mm -hmm. which. Um, I'm allowed to say on, on recorded and I, I'm a bit dubious about the quality of most of them uh, and their scope they're often scope without sequence and uh, uh -huh. they're often vague to being the point of you can plug anything in there and call it a, call it a, a check mark so what, what's, what's fascinating about that is like uh, we're making that claim too and I'm making that claim in Canada for sure and Eric's brought that up for the states but 
Engelman talked about the same thing happening with the, the, the core standards in reading and in mathematics for children. Like this is a, it's not even just a music thing. There are inappropriate standards flying all over the place. I would love to somehow be polymathic enough to know just how far off the mathematical standards are and the reading standards are as compared to how obtuse I find some of the musical standards. Uh, I would I still Reading for sure. <laughs> reading would... for sure. I've, I've dove into that world, but it's, yeah. it's just as concerning. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, you want to you want to you want to sit in a room with these folks that create these standards and say, are, are you just grabbing a corner of something you find fascinating and inflating it into something? I almost view it like it's been done by committee somehow. And each person wants yep. to get their own little corner in and then sequence gets lost and and, and readiness gets lost. And yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's interesting. And then the, they get vague, more and more vague and more puffed uh, the further up you go, just just adding a verb somewhere here and there to a sentence from the previous year. And, you know, you, you, you can sense it falling apart as it moves sort of up through the, the, the year groups. At least that's, that's certainly what I see in music. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, and I think the overall tendency when you start focusing, because you're not working with children when you're developing these things. They're working in a in a committee right right that what happens is you don't be, you become focused on everything but the child so you're teaching the curriculum to the child rather than teaching the child the curriculum mm. exactly you know and that and that automatically breaks things down and, and of course it makes things harder for teachers to try to vary their instruction when you've got all these different kinds of children in the eighth grade that are supposed to ma you know meet this skill right mm -hmm. and they can't because why well they didn't get it early enough or they didn't get it last year and i'm absolutely <clears throat> and meanwhile we're killing the kids Sorry. that are in the top wrong yeah boring them so but that we have these general that they, they should be guidelines and not tested for like whether you could pass or fail. Well, I'm actually but, open but to the testing if from. the standards are extremely rational and, and rigorous and right. sequential. But uh, when they're not great. laid out I... like that, testing... I mean, you can't test some someone on something they, they didn't have the chance to learn yeah. <laughs> properly. Yeah. yeah. So, But I think a lot of people resort to the attitude that testing is dubious, which it is when the curriculum is dubious. Well, it should be, you know, ideographic in addition to the normative... Sure. Right, mm -hmm. but you look at, you know, a kid for five years, and what do you expect the sixth year? They're going to be a great game, mm -hmm. somewhere if you're if you're teaching him well or her well. I find I yeah. find at least uh, with um, and and please correct me if I've got this wrong about Engelman. Engelman, I believe at least would 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 certainly have in common with Gordon that uh, the kids are are gathering in their sort of um, uh, rote or however you want to call it qualitative perceptions and then later on we're, we're generalizing from that and that direct instruction ought to involve if, if, again please do correct me but i believe the direct instruction side of it is sort of you know give them the the the, the in gordon's words the, the vocabulary the tonal vocabulary to begin to generalize with uh first and that's the that's that's what's so side. amazing about engelman is like that is encapsulated in his theory and and you know he would say um there are certain things you have to learn by rote you know, counting mm -hmm. to ten, yes. you can't you can't learn that theoretically. You just have to mm -hmm. repeat it with kids. One, two, three, yeah. four. I mean, that has to be done by rote. And the generalization, you know, it takes place um, at a certain time, and you can often do it faster than you think you can if you sequence things properly. Um, there's a there's a there's a there, there's a enormous and 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 recognizably valuable push in in upper education for middle school and high school that i saw overseas uh in in british uh, uh, schools and and i see it in american schools and everything should be about higher order thinking skills and i think that the part of that is really wrong-headed um because if you get if you try to get kids to do inferential thinking and they don't have anything to <laughs> to 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 think about the the you, you choke off both there's a whole school overseas that gets derided a great mm -hmm. deal there's a there's a, the Schuifat system which is mm -hmm. a french originally a french system and uh and that's it's pure rote 
I mean, all day long road, and and people and mm -hmm. other educators just turn their noses up at it. And you look at the results that you get towards the end, and these kids are are not only are they extraordinary critical thinkers, they're they're making they're making their way into colleges, uh, great colleges worldwide, you know. And it's like it, 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 I'm like, look at the evidence at the end, and think it through. You've given them the exactly. tools to think, the 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 stuff to think with. Now they're you know. And, well, and, and this this is really the problem with constructivism when it's when it's so ideological. It says the only things that matter are higher order thinking skills. Right. And if you learn anything by rote, you're essentially just you're being mm -hmm. forced yeah. into some kind of uh, <clears throat> militaristic, authoritative education yeah. system. But the, yeah. the the reality is you can't learn higher order thinking skills unless you have basic skills in your memory bank yeah. to begin with. And that's been yeah overwhelmingly proven by educational scientists and it's amazing how well this transfers into mlt i mean you have to learn to sing patterns I mean, yeah. by right if, no... if, 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 think, if thinking can be defined even like uh, rudimentarily rudimentarily wow i haven't slept um as as sort of the manipulation of memories you know moving them around combining them you know letting them crash into each other you got to have some things in your long-term memory first so this opens up the conversation for like the elephant in the room that i'm thinking of what the position that ron's being put in here where yeah. students are obviously <laughs> decoding notation without being able to notation oh, yeah. audiate and for most people especially administrators i can imagine concert band is associated with using notation now yes. if i was in your position I'm already thinking of stuff like, well, these kids can't notationally audiate. They can't even audiate at an oral, oral level. So it's not right. going to be appropriate to teach concert band songs using notation <laughs> right now, at least. And you have to, like, I'm, I'm, I'm just throwing that on the table because I'm, I'm yeah. seeing this as a big, big issue educationally. But then you're probably going to get pressure from the admin as well, unless you have some buy-in. Yeah, I'm 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 working on the buy-in side. I want to educate anybody that, that's willing to listen about the, the science of this stuff, and <clears throat> and I've gotten better at at that that at being more concise about it. Uh, although consideration will never be my <laughs> my strong suit. Uh, it all everything relates to everything in my head. But but with the um, you know I, I've already discovered that uh, you know this is a this is a college preparatory school. We've got some great great bright bright young students in the school. And, and, you know, if you're out there listening, Lincoln College Preparatory Academy kids, this is not flattery. This is the first school I've walked into where the middle school standard of audiation at least looks like they've got an oral, oral foundation, whether they got it by accident or by dint of being uh, a group of really special kids. <clears throat> so I, I walked in and they're already, they're already able to find resting tones, even though no one had ever asked them to. And, and I told them point blank, I said, we're going to be sort of doing a parallel program, one that, that looks very traditional in terms of uh, what, what's been called reading that, that you know properly ought to be called decoding. And I'm also gonna be teaching a reading program in parallel. And, and hopefully we can use, you know, do both and then and phase out the one as the other one allows you the strength to, to look at some notation and truly hear it inside your head before you play it. I think Gordon's mm -hmm. wonderful phrase of, or somebody's wonderful phrase that, you know, all musicians, true musicians play by ear whether they're reading or not. And I know I wasn't that kid when I was in, in middle school. I was on my little marimba, and all I had to do was hit the right bar. And uh, so I think I was I was notationally audiating the rhythm, and I and and uh, and letting yep. the bar do the work for the the tonal audiation. Um, <clears throat> and uh, and I think that that's extraordinarily common. And sure, you know, one of the other things that's really common that I see from the students that I have that are in concert band, and sometimes they'll you know they're often taking piano with me and playing in concert band on the side. And right. they'll bring up the fact that like they once they understand what audiation is after taking lessons with me for enough time, they realize they're not audiating the pieces they're playing in concert band. And right. I, I would say virtually across the board, concert band teachers don't give kids um, the songs that they're listening, that they're expected to learn. They don't give them a recording that they can even mm -hmm. listen to. And so, I mean, how how common is it in, in concert band? that the tuba player in a high school concert band can't even recognize the main flute melody of the piece unless it's from a movie that they've watched before. Right. Like, that's just the right. norm in, in yeah. concert bands, unfortunately. Yeah. And that is such an issue. Uh, and I'm sure you're not going to fall into that yourself. I, I, that I, I, see. 
<laughs> I, I optimistically pulled out a piece of music that uh, I just always have loved and uh, <clears throat> knew that the, the school had an, a very high standard of musicianship. Um, some excellent directors in the past. Um, little little sort of bottleneck that, that's kind of choked things off that certainly includes COVID. And so there's some really, really strong players as seniors. And I grabbed this uh, old Clifton Williams piece called Fiesta that happens to be in five. Really wonderful concert band piece, and uh, and I'm uh, I've already sort of uh, taken it down notationally for myself, uh, turned the score into a kind of uh, shrunken version that I'm going to be presenting to the students. Where you know, can you can you sing the, the the trombones line that they're they're accompanying you with? Do you know what's happening in the uh, the little counter melody that shows up in the in the oboes and flutes? So yeah, I, I don't mm -hmm. want it to be what you just described, where you know where the kid doesn't even recognize the tune. Uh, I, I, I live that I live that myself again with with choirs sure. I sang I sang in singing bass parts and then hearing the whole thing and going oh. I had no idea that was going on. But what's funny for me in concert band, I, I got the sixth satisfaction of just oral oral. So like I was a tuba player and I played sax, but I would often just try to figure out how to play the flute melodies that I would hear, you know, and I yeah. get in trouble for doing this in concert band. But uh, I, I was just always trying to figure out how to play things. So I didn't, uh, you know, so I was listening, but I did notice a lot of the times people weren't really paying attention and I definitely notice it now. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it really is. You know, if, if we're teaching traditionally, and you want people to audiate, you're really, really only going to be preaching to the, the kids who have, enough, uh, aptitude to to sort of extract the essentials from, the ongoing melody and store those and build a vocabulary that way and start subtract. Uh, I should said the tonal essentials and pull out the rhythmic essentials and start building your vocabulary, um, sort of. And on on the side, you know, as a, mm -hmm. as, an, as a kind of ancillary thing that just, just happens. And of course, I think that I suspect that's that's another one of the reasons why Dr. Gordon's work hasn't really taken off, because I think the highest aptitude folks can be taught traditionally and end up audiating and improvising and truly reading notation audiation, I guess to call it that. Um, and so maybe it's, you know, there's even a suspect idea from the most gifted folks that that makes it look like well why do we need to do it this other way uh and i suspect bo on it without without flattery and i, I bet eric would back me up on this i suspect you're one of those dudes <laughs> i mean have you ever yeah been, I, you I remember you? um the the first time i got a saxophone i got a finger like i got a book with a fingering chart and i got a song that was disney solos for alto sax and i knew all the songs because i'd listened to these disney songs forever and i could just <laughs> play the songs and I wasn't notationally right. auditing the rhythm. I couldn't, I, I, but I could look at the music and be like, Oh, that's that song. I can see ding, 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 mm -hmm. ding. Like, and yep. so there was something like a, like a pri like a primitive notational audition right. like, already baked in there, but I had these songs I could recognize and it, yeah. you know, it was within 10 or 15 minutes. I could play most of the songs in the book. It was, it was just a matter of, you know, putting two and two together. But I, yeah. that, that's after, you know, that was that was a full lifetime of listening vocabulary that got me to right. that point. That wasn't until I was like eleven and and so But again, but again, the full lifetime of listening vocabulary for you personally, and I don't know if I'm right about this, was probably not pattern grown, so to speak, in any traditional Gordon sense and MLT sense. It was you were probably the melodic kid who's extracting those patterns. You still have a pattern vocabulary that you didn't necessarily have to be uh, taught by rote directly, you intuited it. Uh, you you pulled those patterns out yourself. You you constructed, you know, which sure. we could somehow listen to little little Bo at at age five and and test you against uh, uh, division division elongation patterns and triple. Maybe that that would falter, but your macrobeat and microbeat would be rock solid. You know, sure. you probably grew them in the exact sequence that that this man is is discovered in the taxonomy. Oh, so I'm convinced. I'm convinced I did, and I and I also think one of the um... I've mentioned this on the podcast before with Eric many times, but I do think that because I didn't have anyone doing tonal or rhythm patterns with me, right? But right. I've re I've obsessively listened to the same songs over and over again. And at what mm. point, what at what point does like a two-hour John Williams movie just then in, turn into a two-hour LSA? You know, like <laughs> just or or like I'm watching Indiana Jones every day for months on end. Yeah. Like the melodies have been seared into my mind. So I think they're it, it's hard to tease that out. At some yeah. point, because I, I I have a lot of, um, but think about uh, that first that first like a uh, mi sol do. That's that's the sort of core of ba ba di ba. You know, that's the same chord. Yeah. 
But yeah. right, if it's if it's me me so dumb, right? Uh, if I don't think is that thing is that thing Mixolydian? Yeah, I mean, I hear it in major, and then and then going to Mixolydian at, at you know. At, but either, either way, okay. Part. But you know, does 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 Young Bo grab out that that three note pattern from from the full thing? Drop the drop the passing tone, and then Young so I Bo think he hears... did. And the reason is <laughs> Young Bo also recognized that that was the same as Frosty at the Snowman. And I was about to say, does I, and see, I was about to say, I was and I was about to say, did Young Bo also recognize it? <laughs> Consciously or unconsciously, that that was that's the beginning of of uh, uh, sun will come out tomorrow. Uh, right, that's you got the music, guess, the, eh? right? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's in there, and they're all. I I think that's the nature of a robust pattern vocabulary that then of yes. course gives gives rise to. Hey, why did why did you just have such a great quote unquote guess? It wasn't a guess. It was it was it was inference based on a whole lot of, of robust uh, pattern uh, comparison and uh, and i think that's, so this is the issue you find yourself in as a concert band director because if 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 a much so much of your time is drained trying to do this like this decoding that's not actually helping audiation how are you building these skills with kids that are on all different levels audiation wise to begin mm -hmm. with while mm -hmm. you're trying to teach them songs and, and so i see a huge potential here for you to compose music for the concert band yourself and even give individual parts that are more suited to where the person's aptitude is. I, I I'm imagining that could have a lot of potential there, oh, um, but I'm not yeah, sure if you've gone down I, that road of, of uh, composing I, tunes I've, that are more appropriate for where they are. I, I've imagined it. And, and every time I imagine <laughs> it with the pace at which I work it editing anything, <laughs> my own speech, my own writing, my own composing, I also imagine that my marriage would end, um, <laughs> and I love my girl. So yeah, I, I, I suspect my, my greater goal will be to create a kind of tailored teaching um, mm -hmm. that really zooms in on on letting kids know that you know if you're if you have a, a, a slightly weaker uh, when Gordon's uh, balance test uh, being a predictor of improvisational ability at least at some level, I view the balance one as as the tool with which we do our syntactical organizing in terms of what what comes next what goes with what is what it's essentially asking so i'm a kid who doesn't who wouldn't score terribly high on that um mm -hmm. and i i grew up in a family of improvisers and was always the one that was looking around going how are they doing this so effortlessly and i realized now i had two a twofold problem i didn't have enough tonal vocabulary to mm -hmm. in in my in my tonal bucket to, to even reach in and grab and the grabber tool if you picture it like the old uh, claw games and where you have to grab out the little bunnies and everything i view the balance tool in the head as being almost like the claw how intelligent is it how efficient does it does it know that this will go with this and go grab it um that works slowly in my head hence hence my lack of concision in both speech and my uh, kind of a rambling nature in my own improvisations too so then editing becomes my real tool for for, for creating something useful to other people but mm -hmm. so then the editing takes a while and uh yeah so i think what i'm gonna end up doing is 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 building a program based around some tools I kind of created during COVID that that allow kids to <clears throat> do their own sort of tonal vocabulary growth, their own rhythm vocabulary growth. They don't have to be Gordon experts to do it because I kind of built it into the tools. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to do a whole lot with, uh, with folk songs and, and transformations of them and this kind of stuff. And, uh, and then I will still be teaching quite traditionally, but I intend to not fall into the, the, the ego trap I would have fallen into as a younger man, which is to give the hardest music I can possibly give to my kids so that we can we can show sure. off that we played piece of level six or sevens and these kinds of things. And yeah. I, I really would rather have them have a, a folder absolutely chock full of great literature that, that we can read through and start making comparisons among and, and, and use as at least uh, some level of audiational mm -hmm. um, benchmarks for the future. Yeah, I mean, excited. I'm excited about the complexity. Oh, that sounds I'm great. Excited. I'm excited about the intricacy of it. I'm excited then, about trying to do it in a way that can be useful to other teachers, possibly in the future. <laughs> and then, what if we gave you uh, a student teacher, a MLT new graduate, right, and have you off ramp some of the stuff so that you could work on the deeper 
programmatic <laughs> issues and have somebody else write the you know the tonal patterns, rhythm patterns, or the you know do do some of the dirty work and 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 grow them up inside of a tradition of MLT. You know that we could begin like how do you transform a program that you're inheriting to one that is full blown audience? It's, it's you know I mean I I I, I know full on that that because the high school program is is smallish and the 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 seniors the we we have we have a we have a kind of a hollow of of a not a large number of 11th graders not a large number of 10th graders and and quite a large number of seniors i know i'm going to be kind of growing it from the bottom up uh, through through getting more bodies in in through the middle school um <clears throat> and i'm loving the group I'm, i currently have at the middle school uh you know, I, I, I told an administrator the other day that I want to start two classes of 50 beginners next year and uh, you know, mm-hmm. did not get a did not get a full reaction to that. Because right now I have one class of beginners and uh, one one class is sort of called the intermediate band. And uh, and that's it at the, at the middle school. And I, I, I don't mind if it means I'm teaching more than an, an official contract. It's it's an exciting, exciting possibility. And I want to do it well enough. I want to do it well enough that it that you know if if I did get that that intern, that I can be useful to the intern and have it be something they say okay I I see how this could work, and that person has a little little bit of chance to 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 use it. I've always been a a, a proselytizer of some sort for for this for Gordon's work and uh, and I believe in it firmly. I believe he really cracked a lot of codes that that if we understand them well. Mm-hmm. They, they could really be of true benefit for, for a lot of kids, you know, getting more kids to be more musical, more efficiently kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, the, the doing of it, the, the, the heavy lifting that'll be the next couple of years for me is, is going to be ensuring that the larger community comprehends, at least at some level, what, what we're trying to do, what that looks like as a as a neophyte uh, 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 audiation based program and, and, and as we, we grow what they should expect to see from more and more kids. I've already lived it at some extent uh, overseas, so I know what, what to expect, uh, even though I'm, I'm comparing in my head a choir, a choral based elementary school that I was able to get to a pretty high standard <clears throat> with now middle school, high school instrumental. But, uh, but, Functionally, you know, again, what did little little Bo do? He was a great audiator. He grabbed a saxophone, didn't really need much in the way of the fingering chart after a few moments, and he's playing away at multiple tunes. I want that same sort of discovery of of ear to hand that 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 audiation becomes a kind of physical gesture. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, why why even though you can't see me because my camera's having problems, I'm gesturing in midair like you know we Italians do as <laughs> I speak. You know, well, the, your, your your ability to, to to finger an instrument to me should be that level of gesture, a kind of unconscious assimilation of movement. That that yeah. ex, to me, that's that's expression. To me, that's freedom mm-hmm. of expression. Where where yep. technique yep. is 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 so subsumed that it's it's into audiation that it almost becomes invisible. Yeah, Ron, I so con- so want to come and and work under you are you kidding me <laughs> and i want and i want to take you know like just give me five or six kids right all the best and get them playing the blues yeah, that's all yeah. just get them playing the blues first right. and we'll go from there we've got, our, we've got like, a little after school jazz three combo chords, starting on tuesday uh, and just your yep. small group stuff like just like get them to go on their own and just go play yep. yeah and then you wouldn't have to be there you yeah. know Give them the homework they need every week. Like it's all on tape. Here's your here's your assignment. Go learn it. Yeah. You know, pick up this tune, pick up that tune, and they start with the blues, and then start adding changes to it. And you know, and then turn them into the. You know, I'm going to call you. Next I'm going to call Davis you Doctor Rasmussen when I answer this. Not my dear friend Eric. Well, Doctor <laughs> Rasmussen, they're already going to be your students, whether you're physically here or not, because I'm using your harmonic learning sequence already. With with the middle school guys, um, they've already lived a little bit of your your yes no game. Uh, with uh, and with middle school, we we went right from yes no to, to actual names of tonic and dominant. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, they're they're hearing that pretty clearly. So when we got to uh oh, 
<laughs> you know, you know, when when a third of the kids automatically recognize, okay, that is definitely something new. You know, it's it's like you know, yeah, it, it makes so much sense what you what you've been yeah. doing. So yes, oh, they are already yeah. your students, Doctor Rasmussen. Yeah, well, it folds so neatly into everything else that's already Gordon. You know. Yeah. It, and it, and it, Engelman. It, it, I, <laughs> Yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. It's well, too bad. That was an accident. It's too bad we never <laughs> got those two guys in the same room at the same time. Um, and what was what was? And I don't know enough about Engelman to know what was his uh, time frame of, of life. I assume we're, we're talking about him in the past. I assume he's passed. Pretty parallel. Just he was a pretty parallel. Was working the uh, in the sixties. Heavy yeah. work in the sixties. Uh, cool. Yeah, I think possibly a little little later, but he passed away around the same little time bit. as Gordon. Um, hmm. You know, Ron, I did want to double back just a little bit because when we're sure. talking about uh bridging two different mm. curriculums or two different two different music making philosophies and i i mentioned earlier i'm in a similar position as you where students are coming to me saying i want to do these classical exams there's books with the pieces that they have to use, use. there's scales there's all these kind of mandated um there's mandated yeah. content that they have to use that yes. i can't necessarily just throw out and so right. what's the most skillful way to get that done while teaching them, you know, what we consider to be important. And I, one conversation I want to open up here is the, the potential to use notation in a, in a way where they're not notationally audiating it, right? We have notation in front of them for pieces yes. they have to learn. But I think there's a way of, of using that notation in, in a way that is much more aligned with MLT principles. So, for example, I have a student that's working on their grade three RCM stuff right now. And I'm, I don't put the music in front of them and expect them to just decode it and audiate it. We'll actually go through the piece a couple bars at a time, and I'll make sure they've established meter and context, and meter and the resting tone and, and all that, macro beat. And mm -hmm. I'll just play them the melody, and then I'll teach yeah. them the melody by rote. And I'll show them, okay, that's what you just played, what you see here. And so I'm using the notation in a very loose way, kind of as a guide for what mm -hmm. we're doing. And I haven't really seen any major problems with that in terms of it screwing up someone's audiation it's just kind of in my mind the the kind of salvaging what's useful from the notation while they still kind of have to have it they have to use it at this right. level and i ma imagine you're you know probably going to be in a similar situation where working on these concert band pieces and the notations in front of them but you know the question are they even getting an oral model of what they're hearing and... Right. <clears throat> no, they, they they will be from me. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, I, yeah, I can't help myself with that in that regard. And I think it's funny you say that, you know, how you said you're using the notation in, in this slightly loose, more loose manner. I, I suspect the kids are all doing that anyway. I mean, ultimately, we're going to still as we're if we even do an absolutely traditional route, you're going to have a great deal of repetition in the room. You're going to have uh, flute player number one who has uh, perhaps just the just the intellectual wherewithal to go from eye to hand with or without audiating it fully. <clears throat> and then the kid right next to her. You know, my mm -hmm. wife describes herself as, as always wanting to be second chair flute in any band she was in because she didn't mm -hmm. want to read. So she wanted to make the other kid do the, the, the notational stuff so she can just listen and play by ear. And I told her, I said, I remember telling my wife, I said, well, that's because you had such a great ear. And she does. She sings beautifully. You have such a great ear that, that we really should have taught you to read pattern by pattern, not note by note. And I often find, of course, these kids with these great ears, forgive me for that. Um, these, these folks that have such good ears that oftentimes they don't want to read notation dot by dot by dot. They chafe against it. And that makes perfect sense because they've already gathered in so many patterns that if you just taught them pattern-wise. So I think what you just said about using the notation loosely, I think we actually do that in a traditional context too by default, just through sheer sort of repetition of, repetition. of, the, yeah. of the tune. So if we can I guess my more... I, guess, I guess my interest is how many teachers um, are doing that intentionally. So like my yeah. band teacher, for example... He, he used to get us to try to like sight read stuff, like decode it on the spot and stuff sure, like that. Yep. But if we were having problems with it, he would just pick up his trumpet and play the melody and be like, this is what I want you to do. And then, you know, so there was there was always an oral model of what you were supposed to be playing if, if he heard you having trouble with it. And I don't see that like with a lot of piano teachers, especially. It's kind of mm. like a pencil's being put on the notation. 
and they're just waiting for you to play the next note, the next note. There's never mm-hmm. like a, uh, I'm not, I'm not saying play the whole piece for the students, even though that's a great right. thing to do. I, I often just like playing, like play the phrase for them. Yes. Know? hundred percent. And, and, and I, yeah, I, I can't, I can't not do that. Uh, once I, once I yeah. learned how to be a useful teacher in elementary schools for kids. Um, yeah, it, 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 it informs a great deal of my, my teaching right now. And we always got to remember that the symbols on the page are ambiguous. They really mm-hmm. still, you know, if the kids not bring in contextual awareness of the mode, well, you know, we're going to get that sort of band, sound of intonation that's that can be quite scary sometimes in sight reading and uh yeah. and uh, in, in rhythmic context of course in style you know yeah or I, the I, notation could just be wrong i mean i've done classical guitar exams and i always <laughs> get playlists of the songs and listen to them and i will yeah. find notes that are like in the middle of chords in like Giuliani classical guitar pieces that are wrong in the edition mm-hmm. that i have and i would mm-hmm. only know that if i had listened to other editions and just like that one note is wrong. I can hear that. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that I had enough notational audiation myself to discover some wrongness in this Clifton Williams just the other day. Uh, a, a piece of music that, you know, has, has memories from my childhood that, you know, just a delightful piece of music. And it has great piece. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I, I'm like, I'm looking at the score. I'm, I want to say it's on page 12 or 13. I'm going, oh, that's just not right. That's wrong. Okay. Yep. That's wrong. I was like, okay. Good. <laughs> I'm, I'm reading for uh, truly reading with comprehension without necessarily uh, having to do what I used to have to do, and that's you know go check it on a piano myself. You know, and and Jim Jordan mm. also took his music and stopped giving out parts and just gave out you know recordings of the bass. <laughs> you know, part for this, mm-hmm. and, like everybody learned the part by ear. He said, "Why didn't I think of this first? Yeah, I, I think, well, I, I think I, there's such a disparagement. You know, I mean, we, we still do it in education. We still do it in music education. I don't think Gordon folks do it as much, but, you know, well, they're not a musician. They play by ear, which whenever you say that phrase out loud, and, and it's funny because <laughs> my father was a very, very capable improviser. He, he was improvising organ fugues and uh, just dazzling uh, as an improviser. And... I think he wasn't much of a reader for all the same reasons that I just said about notational ideation. And if he went anytime, you know, you know, decided to teach himself to read, all the traditional materials went dot by dot by dot. And if he trusted that, then there's a cognitive dissonance that sooner or later it's like, now nah, he'll just go back to jamming on his organ and playing the way he likes to play. And uh, <clears throat> and so he he wanted the rest of the, he wanted his children to be you know musically literate. So the the notation was was really thrust hard upon us um and i wanted to be good at it so i went i followed all the instruction i was given and ended up not certainly not being able to do one of the things i wanted to do which was improvise <clears throat> and i don't think i was truly all that much of a, of a reader uh, except that again I, I could notationally audit rhythm quite well and i was playing mostly marimbas and percussion so the mm-hmm. instrument was you know was at least covering my lack of tonal audiation and uh yeah, so all of those things inform my teaching, and I and I want to make those things both explicit to my students, explicit to parents, explicit to administrators, and perhaps even to the larger community as we begin to go forward. Because if I do my job right, the intonation is going to get really special uh, compared to most bands, mm-hmm. and the uh, and the stylistic integrity is going to start to show up, and 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 the, the conductor's not going to be beating time up there because man, they just they they really they my gosh they do retardandos and the chelerandos together without mm-hmm. me you know and uh, those kinds of things and rubato starts to take care of itself, and I experience these things at uh, at the elementary school. One of my greatest forms of pride was cool and we had a whole school assembly and by that time as the kids we're talking about 500 kids walking into a gymnasium were coming in they knew that we were going to be doing little little pattern work and little audiational things and i'm just sort of playing around on a piano that was going through the speakers and i just stop in midstream and the whole the whole auditorium would sing resting tones and all this and and he's just looking around like what the heck is going on and i said oh watch this and I and I started them on I started playing um, Wonderful World, so the auditorium starts singing Wonderful World, and 
the kids with the best audiation are harmonizing it in ways that I hadn't taught. The, the fifth graders, uh, it's a British school, so they call them year six, but what, comparable to age-wise sixth graders. So he's hearing harmonies emerge and this and that, and I said, oh, no, no, watch this. And I, you know, stop playing. And they're just, they're flowing down. They're, they're the whole school rubato happening. And, you know, I said, it, and, you know, it didn't pull itself apart. It didn't, it wasn't that this chunk of 40, set, 40 kids over in the far left corner suddenly is on a different, uh, different bar or a different beat than, than the 200 kids on the other side of the room. And I said, I said, I, to me, that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's that kinesthetic audiation that, that underpins rhythm that, that is, is really, really one of those things that when you get it going, it, it's transformative. And, uh. And thankfully, I have students that have bought in mm -hmm. quite quickly to the to the movement side. Kids who have sat still their whole life and played their horn, uh, that are moving and feeling things uh, quite quickly. Yeah. That that I think just makes sense. They're bright. They're very. I'm, I'm privileged. They're very, very, very bright students. And uh, so, yeah, I'm excited. I, I get it. My my knees are kicking yeah. away like a like like a little boy right now. Uh, <laughs> I look like I'm running in place in in the chair I'm sitting in right now. <clears throat> uh, if I as I get. Uh, thinking about these things and the possibilities. Yeah. And you know, you've been around the block enough to know what the timeline is for this kind of stuff. And I think that's one thing that screws up a lot of teachers is like MLT, at least from the teacher's perspective can often seem like a slow moving, like it's like a train. It takes a little while to get the thing going, but then once it's in motion, like it has a power mm -hmm. behind it that you can't really access otherwise. And I see teachers, you know, they, they'll go gung ho for a few weeks or a month or right. two and right. their kids aren't like automatically improvising <laughs> and they think something's wrong with the with the theory and it's just you know it's it's just a totally delusional um framework for how long some of this stuff should take like you know how long does it take to learn a new harmony and have it in at the the level where you can generalize and dram it into other chord progressions you know it, it doesn't happen in like a week but sometimes people um you know their expectations are a little off in that sense from what i've seen yeah, and, and it's funny, and as I and I went through that phase too, where where I, I I knew I trusted the research, I knew I was seeing results that that matched what uh, sort of sequentiality and aspects of things when I was I was teaching much more um, closer to to what I think the the old rhythm register books and tonal register books would ask. I was I was kind of just fo following the numbers, so to speak. But at the same time, even though I think that's that's a slow way to go, I was seeing reliable, consistent growth. <clears throat> and as I got better at this, uh, uh, you know, my the time frames became shorter to get higher and higher standards, and more and more kids becoming more musical. And I remember at one point just thinking, discussing this with a colleague who had joined me overseas, a uh, marvelous human being named Rachel Gross. Um, and, and I remember telling her, I said, when you really get it going, you will feel like each, every sort of two week period or so, three week period that you're graced with smarter and smarter students. You'll, you'll feel like you're no longer teaching, that they're coming in to your room just more and more skillful and more and more interested. And it really does get to that point. And, uh, and that, yeah, and it's cumulative and it, and it is. I view it like I tell my students. I said the process we're about to go to is like the front end of a trombone. It's gonna be it's gonna be narrow for quite a while. You might not. It is growing, but it's gonna be growing incrementally, and then it's gonna flare out, kind of all of the sudden. Uh, and what that really is, I think, is a sort of tipping point where enough students are generalizing that their their growth explodes, and then the kids who maybe not yet generalizing in that area. Or whatever, whether that's that's okay. These kids are generalizing beautifully, and Dorian, and these aren't. Then, then now there's a greater listening world going on around you, and it becomes a kind of communal learning that's uh, that's hard to define. But I, I, I see it like little individual flaring nodes in my head, little 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 glimmers that 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 light lights up the other five around it, and it's no longer yeah. what we do traditionally in bands and choirs, where you get one strong kid that can play, and you surround them with the other three, <laughs> so they can listen and kind of millisecond later copy you, and the group does sound better that way. But the learning isn't really taking place in any kind of um, yeah. becoming a next mm -hmm. the next level platform thing, like you just said about when does that harmony truly become something that's that's owned that's owned and can be plugged in another place and yeah. and discovered in, yeah. in in other pieces, you know, where the ahas. 
Yeah, it's gone. It's it's fully yeah, yeah. gone through. And I just view that the, as like, yeah, that's stages. fully your property now. You, you yeah. truly, to use the term, you truly audit it. You know. <clears throat> you know, it's amazing to see when when uh, when someone hasn't had mm. a piece of content go through all the stages like that. They often feel like if you give them a, like if I gave someone a new progression mm -hmm. that was like a one chord to a minor four in major, they'll often feel like they're stealing it from right. me and they're not really composing the song. Like if they were to make a song with that, but once it's gone through all the stages and they're actually predicting melodies with those harmonies coming out, even if they stole the chord progression from another song, they they don't feel yeah. any remorse for putting it in a new song. It's because they they have mm -hmm. this ownership. It's really, over yeah, it it's a you, really interesting thing, thing to think about, right? What what is that? that moment what are those moments that that combine to make something um see when does it cease to be an imitated entity um i i said to a student the other day <laughs> i was playing around with the kidding he was he was really really curious about all this stuff very very bright very intellectual young man and it reminds me uh a lot of, of of myself as a youth because he's a percussionist and he's and he's uh, hammering away beautifully at his marimba, but I don't know how much of it he's audiating. And I told him all this. And, and he's so curious about all this. And so we're having these sort of, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to explain the psychology behind it. And of course, you kind of have to keep reverting to, to, uh, to metaphor and comparisons of language. So I said to him uh, something that I had, it's purely by imitation, but I had learned in my youth and it always struck me as fun. And I said, scintillate, scintillate, globulorific, fain would I fathom thy nature specific. Loftily poised in the ether capacious, strongly resembling a gem carbonaceous. Scintillate, scintillate, globulorific, fain would I fathom thy nature specific. And I said, I just said something to you. His name is Deng. I just said something to you that you know. You know exactly what I just said, but not with that vocabulary. And and in a sense, if I, if I translated it for you step, step by step, scintillate, scintillate. Twinkle, twinkle, globule orific, golden ball, of, you know, good, twinkle, twinkle, you know, and so it's, it's twinkle, twinkle, little star with you know, scientific terminology. And as I'm going through and translating it step by step for him, and he's, <laughs> he's putting it together in his head, I can watch it go from a sort of, okay, I can, I can hang on to the scintillate, scintillate, globularific, but I didn't quite catch the, say that again, the fain would I fathom, which of course translate as, uh, um, how I wonder, how I wonder what you are, fain would I fathom, thy nature specific. And, and he, so as he's putting this thing together, I'm, I'm watching this process and thinking, yeah, that, that's not so dissimilar to what you just said about audiation and, 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 and having the kids gain these, these patterns. Mm -hmm to where they become a usable part of their own vocabulary. And then, it, yeah, the, if there's guilt, as you said, if there's, if there's some weird feeling that, oh, I just stole that. When did, when did the thievery and the, the, the imitation become audiation? And I think it's just it, 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 the pattern, or whether it's harmonic or melodic or, or, or motivic or, or strictly rhythmic, strictly tonal, I think the pattern itself then begins to reach out inside the, the kid's head. And that's what I meant by these little flaring nodes. I view these like little lines stretching, almost like a mind map, from uh, from one one word to another. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the analogy I always tell my students is is my my son's first word was car. You know, we didn't know he was saying car. We thought we had a a little bird for a little while because he was going ka ka ka. What the heck is this little <laughs> bird that we've now got? And it was like two weeks solid that he's doing this. Until we were holding him on a balcony mm -hmm. one day, and he tried to explain to us, with his limited vocabulary, what he was saying. Because he pointed and went, ga, ga. He pointed down at the cars. I'm like, oh my gosh, he's saying car. But the, the key to it is, I told my students, I said, you tell me what his second word was. Was his second word blue, mama, dada, or flower? And I said, all you have to do is just run those in your head and compare them with car. And you'll kind of guess that his second word was blue. Mm -hmm. It was blue car. And I mm -hmm. think those connections that's context that's that that <laughs> thread that for for my young son that blue and car were contextually connected and now he's got this mind map of 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 words that are connected to other words mm -hmm. and and what did mm -hmm. what did gordon say about uh i mean his original definition of audiation eric can you call it up um it was it was like hinged mosaic relationships. Oh yeah, that linked to network of comparative pattern structures. I think. 
Yes. <laughs> okay. And it's yeah. like, okay, <laughs> if you... It, and then that's a very, that's a very good objective, like a uh, third person description of, you know, what audiation is. And I, you know, I've been through this process myself with enough content to like, what is, what is this process like mm -hmm. from the first person perspective? You know, when, when, when the content goes from being imitated content to something that's wired in the, your brain mm -hmm. where the network's now like reaching out and making possible connections with other things, like you're saying, what does that feel like from a first person perspective? And in my experience, it feels like um, whatever you're audiating, whether you're identifying a chord you hear or you're improvising or you're playing it on the piano or what, whatever the, the the type of audiation you're engaged in, it feels like yeah. the thing is pre-baked yes. into your perception, if that makes any sense. So it, it doesn't feel like you hear something and then you take a second to sort it out. It feels like the identification... Um, so if I, if I hear a chord I recognize, it's like the rec the hearing of the chord is the mm -hmm. audiation of the chord. There's not two separate things that are going on, but w when you're in the imitation yes. stage, there's like this lag in consciousness. It's like there's the sound that you hear, and then there's a delay in terms of the whatever the audiated process you're in, mm -hmm. even if it's oral, oral, or if it's verbal association or whatever. But when you when you actually own the pattern, your brain just pre bakes it, it into it, your experience, it, it and really it feels does. different. It really does, I mean, and, and I, I, you know, there's a. <laughs> I don't know if it still exists online, if it was just a, a thing that kind of came and went, but there was there was something online I found once just by accident called a visual thesaurus. And it, you know, you type in the word run into the visual thesaurus and it, it sort of shows you these threads that connect to all these, you know, both direct um, synonyms of run and then sort of the lesser so the, the lesser uh, related but still terms of whether something's running along or running around or now the range of something. We don't normally immediately think of that as, as synonymous with run, but what's the run of, uh, of, of I don't know, these, the, these tools? What's the, what's the, what's the, uh, what's the you know, to, to, to bleed uh, is to mm -hmm. run. Um, and all of these possible synonyms, you know, the old joke, if your nose runs and your feet smell, you're built upside down. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, which is it, you know what I mean? So it, it relies on our ability <laughs> to shift immediately in a millisecond, our contextual understanding of that pattern, whether that pattern is a word like run or the, the, or the tone pattern or rhythm pattern that you fully audiated. And I think once you've done that, it's like, it's wrapped in so much information. It, the, it, it has, it's, it has its life immediately. Um, it has its vitality somehow immediate mm -hmm. uh, on on listening or on 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 on, on the improvisational moment that that feels charmed. Um, I, I think that that's this this pattern has been so well defined in your mind in so many different ways that y you can come at it from lots of different directions and I, yeah, it's, you can recontextualize it yeah, immediately yeah, the, in, uh, in the in the present. I, 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 I remember when Gordon clapped his hands on my shoulders after giving a presentation in, in Dayton that I did not know he it was a uh, it was in two thousand and like two or something, and I didn't know he was in the room, listening to this presentation, and uh, <laughs> you know uh, like my wife took a photo of it and my face so red faced and you know, and he clapped his hands on my shoulders and 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 the third word out of his mouth was a profanity and I loved it because it 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 broke any kind of barrier immediately. He said, "You really know my." You know, and uh, we'll fill in the blank there. Uh, we'll call it crap right now. Um, and and he wanted to talk to me about a very simple, uh, I thought, very simple analogy I was making. And um, so I tell you the story, Bo. I tell you that I pulled the balaclava over my face. Or no, he, he pulled the balaclava over his face, cocked his gun, and Carrie ran into the bank. Now I tell... Uh, Eric, this story, a little bit woozy from the beating sun and one too many uh, 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 drinks, Carrie began to lose control of her boat, and, Carrie, and then Carrie ran into the bank. Now, in Eric's story, Carrie's a female on a boat crashing into a riverside. On your story, Carrie ran into the bank. It's a male using his feet to, to traverse into a, a, a financial institution. And it's all, of course, the same words in the same order with completely different meaning. <clears throat> and to me, 
Gordon thought that was a very elegant, uh, he said he thought it was a very elegant analogy to the, the sort of opacity uh, of, of tonal patterns or rhythm patterns, that because they aren't as specific as language, at least in one way, they're not semantic, but now you can show that the semantic language can also recontextualize itself, you know, uh, even if the words, the full sentence is the same. And uh, so I think that was the beginning of a, of a lovely brief mm -hmm. relationship where I got to spend some time with him in private. And it's an honor, but I still use these mental models of, of, of sort of a little further along than the language analogy, I think, goes um, for most Gordon folk in the skill sequence side of things. But I think it's I think it's not so dissimilar in the content. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, they're great. I mean, I'm, I don't consider myself a great thinker, but there are some great thinkers that have gone down these routes. Um, Howard Gardner... Uh, the theory of multiple intelligence, he originally put music as mm -hmm. a linguistic intelligence before he separated it fully. Um, and I still view him as getting it wrong. I think it's a, it's a you know, it's, its own domain, but it is linguistic at some level, or maybe language is mu musical. Looks like some of the really, really interesting research. And then, of course, the kinesthetic side of things should have been, uh, rhythm should have been sort of separated over there. But all of this stuff to me is it informs my approach to teaching yeah. and what I want my kids to understand about the learning process because if, if I can some, get them to understand it some. and I can get them to mm -hmm. buy into it they become their own teachers and then it gets really exciting yeah mm -hmm. yeah well and that would be a great thing to have you back to talk about is how to appropriately basically teach students what MLT is so in parallel to getting them to go through that you actually uh, I, in my experience you can teach kids yeah. Uh, about what MLT is and how it works, and then eventually they they know some of the principles and how to uh, not not just not just pick up more things because their aptitude is high, but how to actually uh, intentionally yeah. go about putting things yeah. in their audition. Yeah, and another when and you're another not around. thing, we need a, a at least maybe quarterly would be awesome, but yearly a status of league of Lincoln every year <laughs> minimally we get we get like the snapshot of where you are many, and over the course of the next how many you know four or five years we'll have a you know a uh, synopsis <laughs> of what this you know trial looks like for you yeah you no know? I, I'm, I'm thoroughly excited about it that you know uh, again you know the, the, I was laughing as you said that because I thought you know okay where's Charlie Where's your Charlie Parker? <laughs> you know, at the pinnacle side of things, you know. Uh, you know, yeah. has that child actually decided to, to they, join music? They're out there. They're out there. I, I uh, tell my I people mean, all the time, search I, for the... Find the geniuses. They're out yeah, there. Well, I mean, in every school of 500 kids, shouldn't there be a one in 500 musical yeah. line somewhere? You know, somewhere. We've, got, we've got 1,200, so, you know, so, whoever that yeah. child is, she deserves her birthright, deserves... Yeah. The, the, the richness and joy and depth and complexity and subtlety yeah. of this art form just for herself you know that, that you know yeah. the old idea uh, it's beautiful yeah it's exciting it's so beautiful to hear to hear you know somebody <clears throat> Not... preach to the choir <laughs> <laughs> you know like i just sit here quietly and just like listen this is brilliant just okay let it go i'm i am yeah. I, I would like to have ron back to talk more about the uh yep. this balance slash improvising um, topic that he's brought up a few times that I yeah. find profoundly interesting. And it, I, since talking to him a while ago about this, I've yeah. noticed this more with certain students um, because it really explains, you know, what's going on yeah. when someone improvises balance melodies is, that seem to defined by Gordon uh, and rationally resolve. Sure. Rather than... Balance, not balance, like is the clarinet section too loud? Oh, I love, I but, love yeah, the sensitivity I, measures. I, but that, that, yeah, they're fun. Yeah. talk about but let's do that uh ron it's you're you're the best man uh, you're just I, the best I, 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 you were my first cheerleader oh i, 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 I don't understand been, uh, that. I, those kinds of inspired, things inspired you inspired me those kinds of things know. i can't understand I, i've been other people's first cheerleader and to me it's more like how did everybody else miss it um i i i, I know this is a weird way to go but it, it, it i just had a former student um i mean i taught her she was the third grade, second grade, you know, when I left Horizon, and, uh, no, she, excuse me, she mm -hmm. made it up to the top of Horizon, but I started her in, like, third grade or something, and, and she's now, I just saw something online that she's off to Italia Conti in, in London, one of the, sort of the better uh, right. schools for music, and, and, and specifically almost musicals and operetta kind of 
the targeted area. And I had to fight. I had to fight other people to say, do you not see what I see in this kid? And and I, I feel the same way about this stuff, Eric, how I, mm-hmm. how I could be a, a, an early or a first cheerleader of your work is, I just, I want to know where other people's eyes and ears are. <laughs> but I, I... Well, and that's my experience with Eric is like, I, I just, I've ta- been talking to him for so long about this stuff. And I'm almost just like, why are other people just not like, fully adopt like I, I swallowed the pill like within 20 minutes of talking to him and i was like how do i use yeah, this to learn yeah. you know the next stuff the next stuff like because and i think i eric i speak you know on behalf of <laughs> me and ron especially it. that uh you know you're up to some good stuff and i i, I just hope the rest of the yeah. the community well you know, well i've got <laughs> i've got my side the thread. now ron i'm in a band yeah, <laughs> I started a band. It's the I started playing it's, in a band. It, what it is? It's the Ignaz Semmelweis problem. Um, <laughs> the uh, the Hungarian uh, uh, doctor that that figured out that if he just washed his hands before he delivered uh, the babies, that very very few mm-hmm. of the women passed away. And the wealthy hospital right next to him, they were dying in droves. And then he went and worked there for a brief time, and lo and behold, the mortality rates dropped amazingly. But the other doctors were very, very angry at him, because Mm -hmm. who was this guy to say that we should do this thing? And uh, so the poor man died penniless and insane in a a mental institution. And it took another 150 years before hand-washing became an absolutely normal part of of, uh, the American Medical Association and other countries' procedures yeah. for doctors so what's the real this is yeah. my new metaphor for establishing context yeah. just just establish the damn resting time yeah. like it's, it's just like yeah. washing your hands and, it takes, and it it takes 20 so seconds but, but yeah well, I, my point being that we we, we tend to follow yeah. obviously people tend to follow people not ideas and the and the pushback that that poor ignatz received because he was the uh, country doctor so to speak from the more established uh, you know and it's it's hard because it's like really and aren't you all supposed to be evidence-based <laughs> you know the evidence for your work eric is yeah. what you know makes me an instant cheerleader of it you know not that i just yeah. happen to adore you as a human being and i guess maybe Bo, yeah. maybe you're like me in that regard too okay this makes sense let me look further into it is a very exciting thing for me <laughs> Well, when you have when you have evidence, and yes. then you can experiment on it with yourself, and then you can also do some, just some critical thinking. Well, there's a reason all these jazz musicians are audiating harmony so yeah. well. Maybe they're using some of Eric's principles yeah. to do this. So it's, you know, there's a trifecta yeah. of of, yeah. Re, yeah, you, you, uh, of rationale behind yeah. what's going on, and yeah. I, I love the data driven spirit in MLT. I think it's one of the best things. And I'm getting my ass kicked in the band, too, trying to learn these tunes by ear and then trying to figure out how I can learn them best based on, you know, my poor learning sequence growing up, <laughs> my audiation and, and listening vocabulary and putting that all together. It's just, it's a, it's a hairy mess is what it is. Yeah. And yeah. It's, it's fun to think about. And I just can't stop thinking no, about it. No, I can't either. But I, I, can't either. I, I appreciate your support, Ron. I appreciate you. And and uh, Bo well, as well. It's, it's great to have, uh, you know. Uh, well, please, Doctor Doctor Sem, please, Doc Doctor Semmelweis, don't die penniless and insane, <laughs> please. <laughs> I, and one of the two will be true. <laughs> I I am forever I am forever in your corner. All right, guys. <laughs> well, did I do that right? Okay. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. Oh, let's we'll have you, let's have him go out and play a little music. Oh, well, that's right. We have to exit music now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Audiation in the Wild from WBEAU. All the harmonies you wish you could audiate. Good night, everybody. Tip your waitresses. <laughs> there we go. A little duet. Peace. All right. Thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> I messed up. There's a couple notes in there. <laughs> uh, not, 
Not good choices. Hmm.